Chapter 1. What makes Jesus so different? Recently I was talking with a group of people in Los Angeles. I asked them, who in your opinion is Jesus Christ? The response was that he was a great religious leader. I agree with that. Jesus Christ was a great religious leader, but I believe he was much more. Men and women down through the ages have been divided over the question, who is Jesus? Why so much conflict over one individual? Why is it that his name, more than the name of any other religious leader, causes irritation? Why is it that you can talk about God and nobody gets upset, but as soon as you mention Jesus, people so often want to stop the conversation, or they become defensive? I mentioned something about Jesus to a taxi cab driver in London, and immediately he said, I don't like to discuss religion, especially Jesus. How is Jesus different than other religious leaders? Why don't the names of Buddha, Muhammad, Confucius offend people? The reason is that these others didn't claim to be God, but Jesus did. This is what makes him so different than other religious leaders. I think it's important to note at this point that the, the book was written in 1977, so perhaps uh, he wasn't aware that there are, in fact, quite a lot of people that get offended when you mention, uh, particularly Muhammad, I think, in our kind of day, day and age, but there's certainly different cultures where Buddhism or Confucianism would, would upset people. Continuing, it didn't take long for the people who knew Jesus to realize that he was making astounding claims about himself. It became clear that his own claims were identifying him as more than just a prophet or teacher. He was obviously making claims to deity. He was presenting himself as the only avenue to a relationship with God, the only source of forgiveness for sins, and the only way of salvation. For many people, this is too exclusive, too narrow for them to want to believe. Yet the issue is not, what do you want to believe? But rather, who did Jesus claim to be? What did the New Testament documents tell us about this? We often hear the phrase, the deity of Christ. This means that Jesus Christ is God. A. H. Strong, in his Systematic Theology, defines God as the infinite and perfect spirit in whom all things have their source, support, and end. This definition of God is adequate for all theists, including Muslims and Jews. Theism teaches that God is personal and that the universe was planned and created by him. God sustains and rules it in the present. Christian theism adds an additional note to the above definition, and who became incarnate as Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus Christ is actually a name and a title. The name Jesus is derived from the Greek form of the name Yeshua, or Joshua, meaning Jehovah Saviour, or the Lord Saves, and the title Christ is derived from the Greek word for Messiah, or the Hebrew Meshiach, Daniel 9.26 and means anointed one. Two offices, king and priest, are involved in the use of the title Christ. His title affirms Jesus as the promised priest and king of Old Testament prophecies. This affirmation is one of the crucial areas for having a proper understanding about Jesus and Christianity. I mean, I can't really see any issues with that kind of thing so far. The New Testament clearly presents Christ as God. The names applied to Christ in the New Testament are such that they could probably be applied only to one who was God. For example, Jesus is called God in the phrase, looking for our blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Saviour, Christ Jesus, in Titus 2.13. The scripture attribute characteristics to him that can be only true of God. Jesus is presented as being self-existent in John 1.4, omnipresent in Matthew 28.20, omniscient in John 4.16, omnipotent in Revelations 1.8, and possessing eternal life in 1 John 5.11. Jesus received honor and worship that only God should receive. In a confrontation with Satan, Jesus said, It is written, You shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only, in Matthew 4.10. Yet Jesus received worship as God in Matthew 14.33, and sometimes even demanded to be worshipped as God in John 5.23. Most of the followers of Jesus were devout Jews who believed in one true God. They were monotheistic to the core, yet they recognized him as God incarnate. That's a bit of a weird comment, actually, because if they recognize him as God incarnate, that sort of fits the definition of a Christian, as Josh laid out earlier. 
So it's kind of interesting that he still calls them Jews. But I guess maybe the term Christian didn't exist then. Continuing. Because of his extensive rabbinical training, Paul would be even less likely to attribute deity to Jesus, to worship a man from Nazareth and call him Lord. But that is exactly what Paul did. He acknowledged the Lamb of God, Jesus, as God, when he said, Be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock, among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. Acts 20.28 Peter confessed after Christ asked him who he was, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Matthew 16, 16. Jesus responded to Peter's confession, not by correcting his conclusion, but by acknowledging its validity and source. Blessed are you, Simon Bajona, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. Matthew 16, 17. Martha, a close friend of Jesus, said to him, I have believed that you are the Christ, Messiah, and the Son of God, John 11.27. And then there is Nathanael, who didn't think anything good could come out of Nazareth. He acknowledged that Jesus was the Son of God, you are the King of Israel, John 1.49. While Stephen was being stoned, he called upon the Lord and said, Lord Jesus, receive my spirits, Acts 7.59. The writer of Hebrews calls Christ God when he writes, But of the Son he says, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. Hebrews 1.8 John the Baptist announced the coming of Jesus by saying that the Holy Spirit descended upon him in bodily form like a dove, and a voice came out of heaven. Thou art my beloved Son, in thee I am well pleased. Luke 3.22 Then, of course, we have the confession of Thomas, better known as the Doubter. Perhaps he was a graduate student. Okay, this is just feeling like a personal attack at this point. Uh, for those of you who don't know, that's uh, my name, and I just graduated. He said, I won't believe unless I can put my fingers into his nail scars. I identify with Thomas. I, I really do, but that's also what the book says. He said, look, not every day does someone raise himself from the dead or claim to be God incarnate. I need evidence. Eight days later, after Thomas chronicled his doubts about Jesus before the other disciples, Jesus came, the doors having been shut, and stood in their midst, and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Reach here your finger, and see my hands, and reach here your hand, and put it into my side, and be not unbelieving, but be believing. Thomas answered and said to him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, because you have seen me, have you believed? Blessed are those who did not see and yet believed. John twenty twenty six to 29 Jesus accepted Thomas's acknowledgement of him as God. He rebuked Thomas for his unbelief, but not for his worship. See, now that's where I take some issue, because that's when we start uh, favoring faith over evidence, um, because it's literally saying that it's better to not have evidence and believe in spite of uh, contrary evidence or in spite of a lack of evidence. Um, and I think that's one of the the worst quotes in all of Christianity, or the, one of the most damaging quotes, um, but also a very popular one. At this point, a critic may interject that all these references are from others about Christ, not from Christ about himself. It's a good accusation. The accusation in the classroom is usually that those at the time of Christ misunderstood him as we are misunderstanding him today. In other words, Jesus really didn't claim to be God. Well, I think he did. And I believe that the deity of Christ is derived directly from the pages of the New Testament. The references are abundant and their meaning is plain. A businessman who has scrutinized the scriptures to verify whether or not Christ claimed to be God said, for anyone to read the New Testament and not conclude that Jesus claimed to be divine, he would have to be as blind as a man standing outdoors on a clear day and saying that he can't see the sun. Uh, just for people keeping track at home, uh, there was no reference to that, and the claim was that a businessman said that. Uh, don't, don't know why we should trust the words of a businessman, but sure. In the Gospel of John, we have a confrontation between Jesus and some Jews. 
It was triggered by Jesus' curing a lame man on the Sabbath and telling him to pick up his pallet and walk. And for this reason, the Jews were persecuting Jesus, because he was doing these things on the Sabbath. But he answered them, My father is working until now, and I myself am working. That seems like a weird quote to me, because it's drawing a distinction between himself and the father. Not to mention the fact that this is meant to be the same person that says working on the Sabbath is wrong, but who am I to judge? It's just one of the Ten Commandments. For this cause, therefore, the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him, because he was not only breaking the Sabbath, but also calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. John 5.16-18 to You might say, Look, Josh, I can say my father is working until now, and I myself am working, so what? It doesn't prove anything. Whenever we study a document, we must take into account the language, the culture, and especially the person or persons addressed. In this case, the culture is Jewish, and the person addressed are Jewish religious leaders. Let's see how the Jews understood Jesus' remarks 2,000 years ago in their own culture. For this cause, therefore, the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him, because he was not only breaking the Sabbath, but also calling God his own father, making himself equal with God, John 5.18. Why such a drastic reaction? The reaction is that Jesus said, My father, not our father, and then added, is working until now. Jesus' use of the two phrases made himself equal with God, on par with God's activity. The Jews did not refer to God as my father, or if they did, they would qualify the statement with in heaven. However, Jesus did not do this. He made a claim that the Jews could not misinterpret when he called God my father. Jesus also implied that while God was working, he the son was working too. Again, the Jews understood the implication that he was God's son. As a result of this statement, the Jews' hatred grew. Even though they were seeking mainly to persecute him, they had began to desire to kill him. Is anyone else confused about why calling somebody my father makes you equal with them? Because that doesn't really make sense to me. Um, Especially because you've got other pagan religions and stuff where there's people that are, are sons of gods or whatever and they're they might still be classified as gods but they're usually of a lesser power of a lesser status they're usually like a demigod um, or just a man with special powers but for some reason uh i get i guess it's like josh said earlier it, the fact that the jews are very monotheistic if you claim sort of any divinity you must be equivalent to God. Continuing, not only did Jesus claim equality with God as his father, but he asserted that he was one with the father. During the Feast of Dedication in Jerusalem, Jesus was approached by some Jewish leaders who asked about his being the Christ. Jesus ended his comments to them by saying, I and the father are one. John 10.30. There you go, that's a bit more clear. The Jews took up stones again to stone him. Jesus answered them, I showed you many good works from the Father. For which of them are you stoning me? The Jews answered him, For a good work we do not stone you, but for blasphemy, and because you, being a man, make yourself out to be God. John 10, 31-33 One might wonder why there was such a strong reaction to what Jesus said about being one with the Father. An interesting implication of this phrase arises from the when the Greek is studied. Greek scholar A.T. Robertson writes that one is neuter and not masculine in the Greek and does not indicate one in person or purpose but rather one in essence or nature. Robertson then adds, this crisp statement is the climax of Christ's claim about the relation between the father and himself, the son. They stir the Pharisees to uncontrollable anger. It is evident then in the minds of those who heard this statement that there was no doubt that Jesus claimed he was God. Thus, Leon Morris, principal of Ridley College, Melbourne, writes that the Jews could disregard Jesus' word only as blasphemy, and they proceeded to take the judgment into their own hands. It was laid down in the law that blasphemy was to be punished by stoning, Leviticus 24.16. But these men would not allow the due processes of law to take their course. They were not preparing an indictment, 
so that the authorities could take the prerequisite action. In their fury, they were preparing to be judges and executioners in one. Jesus is threatened with stoning for blasphemy. The Jews definitely understood his teachings, but we may ask, did they stop to consider whether his claims were true or not? Well, some of them did, because we already talked about some of the Jews that believed his claims. And, I mean, Josh sort of goes out of his way to make the point that they would be very unlikely to believe his claims, and yet they did. But I guess we're talking about the Jews that put him on trial. Jesus continuously spoke of himself as one in nature and essence with God. He boldly asserted, If you knew me, you would know my Father also. John 8.19 he who beholds me beholds the one who sent me, John 12.45. He who hates me hates my father also, John 15.23. All may honour the Son, even as they honour the Father. He who does not honour the Son does not honour the Father who sent him, John 5.23, etc. These references certainly indicate that Jesus looked at himself as being more than just a man. Rather, he was equal with God. Those who say that Jesus was just closer or more intimate with God than others need to think about this statement. Quote, if you do not honor me, you do not honor the Father. You dishonor us both. Uh, so thinking on that statement, I think there's a bunch of people that would say, like, if you disrespect the Catholic Church, you're disrespecting God, or if you do bad karma, then you're not a true Buddhist, or any number of things. I, I, I don't think that's that quote is equivalent to jesus saying that he and the father are indeed one and that he is literally god i mean he certainly could have made it much clearer at the very least when i was lecturing in a literature class at the university of western virginia a professor interrupted me and said that the only gospel in which jesus claimed to be god was john's gospel and it was the latest one written he then asserted that mark the earliest gospel never once mentioned Jesus as claiming to be God. It was obvious this man hadn't read Mark or hadn't paid much attention to what he read. Sick burn. In response, I turned to Mark's gospel. There, Jesus claimed to be able to forgive sins. And Jesus, seeing their faith, said to the paralytic, My son, your sins are forgiven. Mark 2.5 By Jewish law, this was something only God could do. Isaiah 43.25 restricts this prerogative to God alone. The scribe asked, Why does this man speak this way? He is blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Mark 2.7 Jesus then asked, Which would be easier to say, Your sins are forgiven? Or to say, Arise and walk? According to the Wycliffe commentary, this is an unanswerable question. The statements are equally simple to pronounce, but to say either with accompanying performance requires divine power. An imposter, of course, in seeking to avoid detection, would find the former easier. Jesus proceeded to heal the illness of the man and had the authority to deal with its cause. At this, he was accused of blasphemy by the religious leaders. Lewis Sperry Trafer writes that none on earth has the authority or right to forgive sin. None could forgive sin, save the one against whom all have sinned. When Christ forgave sin, as he certainly did, he was not exercising a human prerogative, since none but God can forgive sins. It is conclusively demonstrated that Christ, since he has forgiven sins, is God. I think it's pretty clear that Josh is not a Catholic, because if he was, um, he would think that every single uh, priest that's uh, doing confessional is, is God, because all of them seem to say at the end, you are forgiven, or something to that effect. Continuing on, this concept of forgiveness bothered me for quite a while, because I didn't understand it. One day in philosophy class, answering a question about the deity of Christ, I quoted the above verses from Mark. A graduate assistant challenged my conclusion that Christ's forgiveness demonstrated his deity, he said that he could forgive someone, and that wouldn't demonstrate he was claiming to be God. As I pondered what the graduate student was saying, it struck me why the religious leaders reacted against Christ. Yes, one can say, I forgive you, but that can be done only by the person who was sinned against. In other words, if you sin against me, I can say I forgive you, 
But that wasn't what Christ was doing. The paralytic had sinned against God, the Father, and then Jesus said, under his own authority, Your sins are forgiven. Yes, we can forgive injuries committed against us, but in no way can anyone forgive sins committed against God except God himself. That is what Jesus did. I mean, you absolutely can though. It's just really easy. Because if somebody else, say um, a friend of mine, uh, Joe or something, uh, hurt another friend of mine, Mark, I could apologize to Mark and say, oh, I'm really sorry for what happened to you. Or I'm sorry for what Joe did. And then I'm I'm apologizing or like uh, on behalf of somebody else. Or in terms of forgiveness, I could say to uh, I could say to Joe, "Look, I forgive what you did." It wouldn't be forgiveness from Mark, but it would be me forgiving him for um, you know social transgressions, in the same way that the court, um, after somebody has served crime, is is sort of forgiving somebody for their crime or saying that they've um, paid repentance for their for their crime. It's not that the um, the victim is forgiving them necessarily, but they can still be forgiven by somebody else. It, it certainly feels far from a concrete argument anyway, um, because people can say things even if the things they say don't make sense. But I'm not even sure if it doesn't make sense here, because they're saying, I forgive you, which they're perfectly within their power to do. They're not saying, I forgive you for what you did to Christ. Yeah, anyway. No wonder the Jews reacted when a carpenter from Nazareth made such a bold claim. This power of Jesus to forgive sins is a startling example of his exercising a prerogative that belongs to God alone. Also, in the Gospel of Mark, we have the trial of Jesus, 1460-64. Those trial proceedings are one of the clearest references to Jesus' claim of deity. Quote, And the high priest arose and came forward and questioned Jesus, saying, Do you make no answer to what these men are testifying against you? But he kept silent and made no answer. Again, the high priest was questioning him and saying to him, Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed One? And Jesus said, I am. And you shall see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. And tearing his clothes, the high priest said, What further need do we have of witnesses? You have heard the blasphemy. How does it seem to you? And they all condemned him to be deserving of death. At first, Jesus wouldn't answer, so the high priest put him under oath. Being under oath, Jesus had to answer, and I'm so glad he did. He responded to the question, Are you the Christ and the Son of the Blessed One? by saying, I am. An analysis of Christ's testimony showed that he claimed to be 1. the Son of the Blessed One, God, 2. the one who would sit at the right hand of power, and 3. the Son of Man who would come on the clouds of heaven. Each of the affirmations is distinctly messianic. The cumulative effect of all three is significant. The Sanhedrin, the Jewish court, caught all three points, and the high priest responded by tearing his garments and saying, What need do we have of witnesses? They had finally heard it from, for themselves. He was convicted by the words of his own mouth. Robert Anderson pointed out that no confirmatory evidence is more convincing than that of hostile witnesses, and the fact that the Lord lay claim of deity is incontestably established by the actions of his enemies. We must remember that the Jews were not a tribe of ignorant savages, but a highly cultured and intensively religious people, and it was upon this very charge that, without a dissenting voice, his death was decreed by the Sanhedrin, their great national council, composed of the most eminent of their religious leaders, including men of the type of Gamaliel and his great pupil, Saul of Tarsus. It is clear, then, that what this is is the testimony of Jesus wanting to bear about himself. We also see that the Jews understood his reply as a claim to being God. There are two alternatives to be faced, then, that his assertions were blasphemy, or that he was, in fact, God. His judges saw the issue clearly, so clearly, in fact, that they crucified him and then taunted him, because, quote, he trusted in God, for he said, I am the Son of God, Matthew twenty-seven forty-three. H.B. Sweet explains the significance of the high priest tearing his garment. 
the law forbade the high priest to rent his garment in private troubles. Leviticus 10.6 But when acting as a judge, he was required by custom to express in this way his horror of any blasphemy uttered in his presence. The relief of the embarrassed judge is manifest. If trustworthy evidence was not forthcoming, the necessity for it had now been suspended. The prisoner had incriminated himself. We begin to see that this was no ordinary trial, as lawyer Erwin Linton brings out. Unique among criminal trials is this one in which not the actions but the identity of the accused is the issue. The criminal charge laid against Christ, the confession or testimony, or rather act, in presence of the court, on which he was convicted, the interrogation of the Roman governor, and the inscription and proclamation of his cross at the time of execution, all are concerned with one question, of Christ's real identity and dignity. What think ye of Christ? Whose son is he? I think that's a really interesting one, actually, because it says what makes that a, a unique trial, and sort of indicates that what makes it a bad trial, is that the identity is what he's on on trial for not his actions of course the jews would say his actions were were blasphemy um, but i can certainly see why you think it's an identity issue but a lot of christians would uh would persecute somebody for being gay an identity um of course some of them would say oh hate hate the sin not the sinner and so they would hate you know gay sex or something like that but there is quite a lot of them out there that just seem to hate people for their identity for being gay and that call for punishment for that identity and um it's kind of ironic that uh this uh christian lawyer is pointing out uh, a similar kind of flaw in this kind of trial judge gaynor that's that's not a joke that's what <laughs> the name of the the judge in the book uh, just ironic that i was talking about that judge gaynor the accomplished jurist of the new york bench in his address on the trial of jesus takes the position that blasphemy was the one charge made against him before the sanhedrin he says it is plain from each of the gospel narratives that the alleged crime for which jesus was tried and convicted was blasphemy jesus had been claiming supernatural power which in a human being was blasphemy, citing John 10.33. In most trials, people are tried for what they have done, but this was not true of Christ. Jesus was tried for who he was. The trial of Jesus ought to be sufficient to demonstrate convincingly that he confessed his divinity, his judge's witness to that. But also, on the day of crucifixion, his enemies acknowledged that he claimed to be God come in the flesh. Quote, in the same way the chief priests along with the scribes and elders were mocking him and saying he saved others he cannot save himself he is the king of israel let him come down from the cross and we shall believe in him he trusts in god let him deliver him now if he takes pleasure in him for he said i am the son of god matthew 27 41 to 43 and that's the end of the chapter. So basically, in answer to the question, what makes Jesus so different? It's that Jesus claimed to be God. Um, I guess we're uh, ignoring other examples of uh, men who also claim to be God or have divine powers or be son of God from all the Greek and uh, Norse mythologies. Um, but there you go. Jesus is very unique because he is simultaneously god and the son of god uh, let me know your thoughts and comments uh wherever you found this audio the uh, next chapter um is a lot shorter so the chapter we just read was the second longest chapter um in this series um the next chapter is uh, lord liar or lunatic which i believe discusses uh, whether or not Jesus' claim to be a god is because he actually was a god, or a liar, or a crazy man. Apparently those are the only options. Thanks for sticking around.